Hi, my name's Lou, and today I'm going to be reading from the internet for you. Why? Well, why not? And today's what is... Hi, my name's Lou, and today I'm going to be reading from the internet for you. Why? Well, why not? And today's what is a legal advice thread. It is found in the Crackhead Clubhouse on somethingawful.com. The original posted by Vlad Templer. And the thread is entitled, Legal Advice Thread, Please Read. And it goes like this. Welcome to the Legal Advice Thread, version 1.2. Disclaimer. This thread gives legal opinions, not legal advice. Nothing said in this thread is to be taken as advice given in counsel. This advice is purely informational in purpose and intent, and in no way creates any kind of contract for legal services between you and anyone at Something Awful, nor any member of the website, and most assuredly not with the author of this writing. This information is never to be considered as a substitute for the advice and guidance of a licensed attorney. You are responsible for your own legal future. 1. Intro for legal advice, please seek the counsel of an attorney. If you have been charged, then this threat is too late for you, and you need to get representation immediately. I highly recommend you visit normal.org and find a lawyer in your state to get assistance. There's absolutely no reason whatsoever in this day and age not to have the phone number of an attorney programmed into your cell phone, so you can call them when you get in trouble, even if you've never spoken to them before. Criminal defense attorneys would much rather get a call from a potential client as they're being processed for the charge than a week before they're supposed to appear before the judge. When it comes to drugs in the United States, you've pretty much got to keep one thing in mind. The law is always against you. In fact, that's just putting it nicely because the reality is the entire system is completely stacked. Cops know they can cross the line to get that bust. Judges back the cops because they're afraid for their careers if they don't. And the prisons, well, that doesn't even need explanation. I don't say this stuff to scare you or create paranoia. I say it because it's the truth. If there's anything America is short of when it comes to drugs, it's the truth. And quite frankly, I think we all deserve some more. Some of the advice I purport here at I purport herein may seem a bit over the top, but you've got to remember that there is no point in me giving you half-assed advice. I'd much rather give general legal advice that met the highest standard of caution and err on the side of caution than to disseminate advice that will not place you in the best legal situation possible. You're always at the disadvantage in our legal system, and the concepts of innocent until proven guilty and beyond a reasonable doubt are extremely lofty ideals in civil liberties. The problem is that if you make it to trial, most juries already assume you're guilty, and reasonable doubt is whatever gets them out for lunch, the movie, or the bar to get drunk quicker. So what do you do? What can you as a normal everyday citizen with little to no legal training and probably not the means to have an attorney on retainer 24-7 that you can call at 2 a.m. to do? You can arm yourself not with the implements of a physical kind, but the implements of the mind. No matter what happens in our society, the government cannot incarcerate your mind, and you can fight against the laws that you so vehemently despise by becoming an educated citizen. This thread exists This thread exists to give you general legal advice about exerting your rights and to ask questions regarding how to respond to situations or what approaches to take. Simply put, if it involves the law, this is the place to go. The most important words you may ever say, an invocation of your Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights. Officer, other than providing my driver's license and proof of insurance, I do not wish to provide any information until I have consulted with my attorney. If my lawyer cannot be reached, I would like a public defender, and I would like to talk to my lawyer now. If you wish to question me or wish to, or wish to obtain a waiver, I want my lawyer present. I do not want my person, car, or other property to be searched. I do not want to perform any physical acts or tests. I do not want to participate in any lineup, nor do I consent to being recorded. If requested to take a breath test, I want to talk to a lawyer first. If I cannot get legal advice, I will submit to the test only if my driver's license will otherwise be suspended or revoked. If a breath test is given, I also want an independent blood test, and I am willing to pay for this myself. If I am under arrest, I would like to arrange to secure my property. I do not consent to any impound or inventory of my vehicle or other property, but I do waive any claim against you for theft, loss, or damage if you allow me to safeguard my own property. If I am not under arrest, I want to leave. Please tell me so I may go on my way. Thank you. What do you do if you can't remember all of that? Keep your mouth shut. 2. Marijuana User Categories Marijuana smokers come in three categories. Tier 1. These smokers are your Carl Sagans. They keep it to themselves and limit their exposure. Most of these smokers are extremely diligent about their surroundings and know full well the risks they're taking. Most smokers in this category only consume at home, inside, and know what to do if the cops actually do show up. Smokers in this category are almost never caught. If caught, 
the smokers in this category tend to call an attorney immediately and try to defend themselves as best as possible. Tier 2. These are your average smokers, your typical college student if you will. Smokers in this category don't want to get caught and will try to take precautions. Smokers in this category often have at least a passing understanding of the legal ramifications of their decision to toke. However, smokers in this category are certainly more lax about their security than smokers in the first tier. They're the smokers that are more likely to smoke while driving, leave a roach in the ashtray of the car, or somehow do something, even if inadvertent, that will expose them. Smokers in this category do get busted, but not as much as those in the third tier. And when they do get busted, they at least check out the idea of legal representation. Tier 3. These are, for the lack of better words, the idiots. Smokers in this category throw all caution and diligence to the wind and often couldn't care less about taking precautions or knowing anything about the law. Smokers in this category tend to smoke whenever and however they feel like it. Exposure be damned. Many smokers in this category never bother to seek legal representation. When charged, many... Many smokers in this category never bother to take legal representation when charged and many will let multiple possession charges over time just accumulate. Most attorneys that have at least a partial specialization in drugs loathe these smokers because they not only tend to always have an excuse about not paying, but they tend to fuck up while they have pending charges which nullifies whatever plea bargaining the attorneys have worked towards. In general, if you meet a tier 3 smoker, stay the fuck away from them. 3 the areas of protection. I'm going to break this initial thread down into three parts, descending from the most protected place to the least. A, your home. B, your person. C, your vehicle. A, your home. In the eyes of the law, absolutely no place gets greater protection than your home. You should consider it your castle and always remember that you have the right to consider it as one. Just like a castle can slam shut the gates and pull the drawbridge, so can you. In that sense, I'm going to focus on the most specific weakness of a castle in your home, the front door. Gone are the days of armies laying siege to a castle. We're in the days of search warrants and SWAT teams, but if a situation arises where you've got a SWAT team stacked up against your door with a breaching ram and a search warrant, you're pretty much done for, so there's no point of addressing that. Thankfully, unless you're a major dealer of illicit substances, you probably don't have to worry about ever seeing a SWAT team bust through your front door. What you do have to worry about is called the knock and talk. The knock and talk. This is a pretty basic tactic of any police officer and something officers are trained in rather exhaustively. A neighbor has called, complaining of loud music, perhaps a fight, perhaps they smelled weed, whatever it is, the neighbors saw when the cops show up, all they have are the words of an eyewitness, which is usually flimsy for a district attorney to go on. So the cops have to do the only thing that the law will allow them to do, which is walk up to your front door and knock on it. Steps. 1. Go to the door. 2. Ask, through the door, for the persons to identify themselves, and the cops will do so. 3. Ask through the door how you may help them, the popo, on this fine and dandy evening. A. The cops will probably ask you to open the door and speak to them. 4. Tell the cops through the door that you will not open up your home without a search warrant and tell them to have a good evening. Walk away from the door. Fact of the matter is that cops can't enter your home without one of two things, a search warrant or an exigent circumstance. If you hear knocking at your door, you're going to do what everyone else does and walk up to the door. So you've done so, you look to the people, and voila, it's the cops. At this point, the police know you're home, unless your lights were off, and they didn't see the peephole being covered up. So you should do what everyone else should do when they see someone at the door, not open it. You should ask through the door for the officers to identify themselves. They will likely tell you they're officers of the law, and will ask you to open up the door and speak to them for a minute. Do not fall for this trap. For the love of God, don't open that door, please. When it comes to complaints about noise and loud parties, cops love it when you open the door because it can give them some sort of a probable cause. All a cop needs for probable cause is plain sight, and they're allowed to enter a home which lets them seize whatever was in plain sight. And while doing so, they're allowed to seize anything else that's in plain sight. So do yourself a favor and never give them a view into your home. If you open that door and those cops even get a whiff of marijuana or anything those cops don't like, they're going to claim something was in plain sight. It may not have been... But who's that judge going to believe? The officer of the law or you? That's what I thought. So the cops have asked you to open the door. Your pulse has skyrocketed and you're nervous. What do I do? Mr. Vlad Templer told me to not open the door. But it's the fucking cops, man. They're going to bust my fucking door down and bum rush like a drug bust. Wrong, sir. Absolutely wrong. Of all the things I've seen, I've never seen a cop break a door jam without a reason to do so. 2. Exigent Circumstance what the fuck is that? I call shenanigans. 
Mr. Vlad Templer, I do believe you mentioned something called exigent circumstance. And that sounds like a really complicated lawyer thingamajig to let the cops into my home. What is it? Well, exigent circumstance is a legal term used in criminal procedure. It basically allows an officer of the law to enter a domicile without a search warrant under three conditions. One, to prevent imminent danger of life or serious damage of property. Two, to forestall the imminent escape of a suspect. Three, or destruction of evidence. Those are the, by definition, factors of exigent circumstance. Now, you're probably thinking, well, I've got you now, you self-righteous prick. If the cops think I'm smoking reefer and I don't open my door, they're going to say they had an exigent circumstance because I'd flush my pot. And here you'd be wrong. A cop can't create the exigency. I'll say that again. The exigent circumstance cannot be created by the officer of the law. So if the cops think you have pot and claim they busted through the door so they could seize it before you destroyed it, they've created the exigency and it won't fly in court. This is actually an issue I've seen come up, and I managed to find massive amounts of it of point case law to back it up. If the cops keep knocking on your door and demanding you open it up, just ignore them. They're just trying to intimidate you into surrendering your rights. Cops do this all the time. Ignore them and they'll go away. If they had a reason to bust through your door and arrest you, believe me, they'd have already done it. So don't give them a reason. 3. A brief note on search warrants. If the cops knock on your door and you follow the above listed procedure and are told they have a search warrant, ask the officer to slide it under the door. Most of the time when cops have a search warrant, they're not necessarily going to hit you with a SWAT team unless it's a genuinely high risk, meaning you're slinging yayo, dude. What you need to look for in a search warrant is pretty simple. Foremost, it will likely look very official meaning we'll have a description of where is to be searched, what they're looking for, the items to be seized, and more importantly, the signature of the judge. So if the cops trying to pull some kind of training day shenanigans, you can tell Mr. Wannabe Denzel to give you his name and badge number. You can then promptly call a lawyer who will move like Speed Racer to get to you and help. Receiving mail. If you choose to ship something illegal through the mail, you must accept certain risks. Foremost is the fact that you are not alone in this attempt, and U.S. Postal Inspectors are well aware of the use of the USPS to move illegal products. It makes sense. You just hope that your package makes it through thanks to the sheer volume, and indeed there's a certain logic to it when sending something from yourself to a friend. Chances are you are not too worried about this, so I'm going to talk to the internet ordering crowd. Ordering over the internet poses many risks. I have not researched this area thoroughly enough to speak exhaustively on the investigation side, but I have seen how the busts tend to go down. Often the postal inspectors, USPI, will have running investigations on certain sites trying to figure out their shipping methods. A retailer on the internet moves too much volume to constantly change shipping methods. So, the USPI will often look for packages that fit their criteria and inspect it. Every so often the USPI get a hit, and that means it's time for delivery. Oh yes, they deliver the package to you now. The USPI have already secured the warrant and inspected the package. Now it's time to put you on the spot. What they do is have the USPI agent dressed like a normal postal worker, albeit strapped in a layer of armor, to hand you your package like any other postal worker has throughout your life. Absolutely nothing will seem odd or out of place. Nothing will happen at this moment. About 10 to 20 minutes, depending how badly they want to make sure it goes well in court, the USPI agents actually bust the residents. By giving time post-delivery, they have found that suspects usually have opened the packages, and some have even started working with the contents. This eliminates the defense of, I didn't know what it was, and intended to return to the post office. They essentially catch you red-handed, and you are at the mercy of the prosecution. Not to seem overly harsh, but the reality of using USPS for moving illegal items is that people do get caught doing it. The USPI is effective, and you can be certain that they have got this all down to a refined science. If you want to take the risk, it is most assuredly yours for the taking. And because of this, I give you the above information so you take the proper moment of pause before hitting that submit order button. Back to the protections areas. B. Your person. Steps. Stop and let the officers walk to you. Do not run. Ask the officers if you're free to leave. If not, ask why you're being detained. Detainment is not the same as arrest, but your rights are still there. If the cops try to search you, refuse any searches. If they insist on patting you down, let them. Stop and frisk is legal, but immediately state that you do not consent to any further searches and request to call your attorney. Do not answer any questions. Simply be silent. Lying, even a white lie, is something else you can be charged with. Above all, be courteous. The scenario. So you're strolling down the street, minding your own business. You've got Rick Astley blaring in your headphones, and before you know it, you're being rolled by the cops. Now that's a Rick roll. Ha ha. Uh, your first move is to stop and let them come to you. I think it goes without saying that you never run from the cops. It'll never work, and you'll only make matters worse for yourself when you get caught. Oh shit, now what? Cops can stop you on the street to question you and even pat you down for weapons. 
So let's start this section by addressing the latter frisk, the stop and frisk. A pat-down search is by definition for weapons, but if a cop feels anything he considers slightly suspicious in your pockets, he's going to find it. So let that be a lesson. If there's anything you don't want to be found, then your pockets are the worst place in the world. What's much better is any kind of bag. So your best bet if you're walking around and you have something illicit on you is to place it inside a container. To give any idea of the legal weight of this, I defer to the Supreme Court of the United States. Quote, for just as the most frail cottage in the kingdom is absolutely entitled to the same guarantees of privacy as the most majestic mansion, so also may a traveler who carries a toothbrush and a few articles of clothing in a paper bag or knotted, or knotted scarf claim an equal right to conceal his possessions from official inspection as a sophisticated executive with a locked attaché case. End quote. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Cops don't expect you to know it, though, and the vast majority of cops don't know it either. If a cop tries to search a bag you're carrying, you should immediately state that you do not consent to any searches of your items. If they search them anyway, you might get arrested, but it's something you can fight. The questioning. If cops ask you for your name, give it to them. If they ask you to see some identification, give it to them. Nothing requires you to carry an ID with you on the street but it's a lot less of a hassle if you just hand them an ID card than it is to say that you don't have one. If you don't have one, they're allowed to attempt to ascertain your identity, so it's best to just comply with the request for identification. By and large, the biggest advantage the Fifth Amendment gives you is the right to be silent. Pause for a moment and think about what I just said. You have the right to be silent. Sometimes, no, almost all the time, the best thing you can do is be silent. Just about anything you say will be twisted and used against you. Refusing to answer questions by silence is a great option to choose. You can't be charged for refusing to answer a question. That's your right. By and large, the biggest favor you can do for yourself here is to be kind and courteous. Like it or not, the cops love to feel in control. So placate their egos. It'll work in your favor and is just one less thing you might have to deal with. Exerting your rights won't piss the cops off. And last time I checked, contempt of cop is not a chargeable offense. So long as you comply with the law, you're fine, even if you are arrested. The threat of the grand jury. Believe it or not, some cops will actually threaten you with this, and I didn't even believe it till I actually saw it happen in a case. Something more educated cops will do when they start questioning you, and you stay silent, is threaten you by saying they'll get a grand jury to make you talk. Well, that's a great idea, and grand, but a cop is not a grand jury. Hell, the cop can't even make a grand jury convene. That would take the DA. If a cop threatens you with this, just do your best to stifle the laughter that I would certainly have, because a grand jury is a whole new ballgame. If the DA has a grand jury convene, the grand jury can consider evidence against you that will force you to appear in court and testify. Notice that whole in court thing? Yeah, it happens in court, with counsel present before a judge. A cop is not a grand jury, he is not a judge, and he is certainly not a DA. Don't fall for his bullshit. And finally, your car. Steps. Have your, driver, have your driver's license registration, if your state has it, and insurance verification handily accessible and not in a location where you'd store anything illicit. Be courteous, but don't answer questions about, do you know how fast you're going, by telling them. That's an admission of guilt. Keep asking, how may I help you? If the cops ask to search your vehicle, refuse. If the officer keeps asking questions, ask if you're free to go. If the officer tells you you're not free to go, then state overtly that you're invoking the protections of the Constitution of this state you're presently in, as well as the protections of the Constitution of the United States, and that you're expressly invoking your right to counsel. Once you've invoked your right to counsel, the cop can either arrest you or let you go. He cannot ask you any further questions. If the officer keeps questioning you, remember this for your attorney. It goes to character slash ethics of the officer. Never consent to a standardized field sobriety test. A field sobriety test is a completely subjective test, meaning the officer doesn't think, quote, would a reasonable person think this driver is impaired, end quote, but rather, quote, do I, the police officer, think this person is impaired, end quote. The difference is huge, and when you willingly submit to a field sobriety test, you're submitting to their subjective inspection of your sobriety. Translation, they're going to claim you failed one of the physical coordination tests. There is no field sobriety test currently available to police for marijuana. Though there is a saliva test, it's still lab-based. And you can simply tell the officer you're willing to blow into, on a breathalyzer, but you won't submit to the field sobriety test. That's all they've got. On to the car. The car is the worst place for you to have a police encounter, period. I'm one of the most careful drivers out there because I'm always paranoid of getting pulled over. The more I've learned about your rights in a traffic stop, and the more I've learned about drug profiling, the more careful I've become. The best advice I can give you about your rights when in a car is that they're nearly non-existent. The Supreme Court has ruled a vehicle is a movable crime scene, and in the infamous 
Wren decision, absolutely any traffic infraction essentially is sufficient to allow an officer to pull you over and cite you for it. So let's roll through your rights in a car. An officer is always allowed to ask you for your driver's license, registration, and insurance verification. These are items you should readily have available in your vehicle. You should know where they are. You should keep these in a readily accessible location that you would never consider hiding something illicit in. My insurance verification is held in a holder that's kept in a place on my visor by my garage door opener. A glove box containing nothing besides copies of the car's maintenance work, the owner's manual, and a disposable camera. Good to have if you're in a wreck. When the cop approaches you in your car, remember the one cardinal rule. Anything you say can be used against you. That cop is searching for probable cause to search a vehicle, and they'll take anything they can get. If your car even remotely smells like marijuana, you're pretty much guaranteed the cop is going to claim probable cause and search the vehicle. A brief segue into toking and driving. I know I'm going to catch some flack for this, but folks, this is the absolute dumbest thing you can do. I don't care if you're the best driver alive when high, you're asking to get pulled over. When you get pulled over, you're going to get searched, and they're going to find whatever you had on you, and you're going to get arrested. Period. Smoking marijuana and driving is absolutely ludicrously dumb. You wouldn't think it's smart to knock back a bottle of whiskey while driving, and you shouldn't think it's smart to toke away on Mr. Spliffy either. So Mr. Vlad Templer, where do I store my shit? The trunk. Above all, the fucking trunk. A trunk is a locked container that is outside the area of your control in a vehicle. Cops are allowed to search within the area of control you have, and so long as your trunk is outside that, hatchbacks don't get an exemption like this. Your trunk is not incident to search for probable cause. Now, if you're arrested, it is. But just because they smell something funky doesn't mean they get to search the trunk. You dig? The best advice I can give you on a traffic stop is to be courteous, but to exert your rights at the same time. Four. Conclusion. That's all, folks. I'm pretty sure there's plenty I haven't covered, and I'm hoping there will be lots of questions. I hope even further that this thread is sticky-worthy and ends up becoming a reference section for people with legal questions. Please ask questions related to the law here, and responses will come. I know I'm not the only legally inclined person on here, so I won't be the only one giving advice. Your state laws may contradict some of the things I've said above, and some of the things I've said above may prove to be false in the future. The state of our legal order is constantly changing, and a single decision by a circuit court that presides over the area you're in may drastically change the state of the law for that area and you. The Supreme Court could turn around tomorrow and completely nullify all the advice I've given above. The only constant in the law is change, and the only disadvantage of our present order is that civil liberties are shrinking faster than the tits of a cheerleader who took off her push-up bra. Stay safe, people, and take care of each other. Okay, well, I hope you're all taking copious notes. Not that you need to. You have the podcast. All the information you'd ever need is right here in your MP3 player of choice. I'm going to go ahead and assume it's not a Zune. Could be. Just the percentage-wise, chances are low. So, anyway, I hope that you are now fully knowledgeable and ready to confront the police, get in their faces, uh, make sure that you stay courteous when you're schooling them on the law. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you again next week, but be sure to check the blog at loureads.com if you haven't, and also uh, subscribe on the iTunes if someone gave this to you and you're just like, this is the best, where can I get more? Well, the answer is... The iTunes from the LouReads.com RSS feed, wherever you like. Just get it. That's the important thing. All right. My name's Lou. This is Lou Reads, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. <laughs>